Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very happy to bring my conversation with Jamie Krems. Jamie is a social psychologist with much interdisciplinary training. She has a degree in classical and Near Eastern archaeology. She has a master's in biological bases of behavior. She has a master's in cognitive and evolutionary anthropology, and she has a PhD in social psychology. Uh, much of her work focuses on stereotyping and stigma on sociality, such as friendship and aggression, and thinking about some of the ways in which systematically women and some of the same sex and gender typical have challenges that they face, whether it's pregnancy, um, avoiding retaliation, and looks at novel research to understand um, some of the phenomena that are relevant across sex and gender. Uh, we spend much of the conversation talking about friendship, um, uh, particularly female friendship, uh, although not just that. We also talk about competition and cooperation, um, but much of the conversation focuses on friendship, which is really a lot of what her work is on, and it's it's just fantastic work. And I was I was so happy to talk to her about all of this, um, you know, good science that she's she's doing with her her lab. We start by talking about some of the particular sex differences between male and female uh, relationships. We talk about the basic features of friendship for males and females, different levels and dimensions of friendship. We talk about how we understand some of the stereotypes of friendships in men and women. We talk about how we define friendship, levels and degrees of friendship, friends and family and friends over time. We talk about jealousy, what that looks like in friendships, friendships, uh, status, and trust. We talk about opposite sex friendships, female competition in the workforce, attractiveness privilege, and female cooperation. Uh, Jamie is, is such a wonderful person to talk to. Um, she's you know able to just not only hold a very seemingly casual conversation, but talking about really good scientific data um, talking about, you know, real world implications. Um, I, I got so much out of this conversation. Uh, I don't think I've ever talked nearly as much uh, scientifically on friendship. And uh, it was, I couldn't think of anyone else that uh, to talk about friendship with than, than Jamie. She's absolutely wonderful with this. Um, really was just a delightful conversation. And so now I bring you Jamie Krems. I am here with Jamie Krems. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very excited to uh, to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, of course. Uh, I was telling you before we started that uh, I've followed your work for a little bit now, and we have a few mutual friends, and so uh, I anticipate we'll have a really nice conversation. When uh, Before we talk about all the stuff you're researching, just tell people who you are and what you research and what you do and all the really uh, important stuff. Yeah, I am an assistant professor of psychology at Oklahoma State University. Um, I am in the Oklahoma Center for Evolutionary Analysis, or OCEAN, uh, which I co-founded with Dr. Jennifer Bird Craven um, and has uh, great folks like Daniel Sneezer, who's been on this, the show, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Juliana French, and some of our incredible grad students. Um, I'm a social psychologist, and I use evolutionary psychological tools to help understand how the mind sort of maximizes the benefits and minimizes the costs of our sociality. Mm, yes, that's wonderful. I've, for for listeners, um, I'll put the, the link in the notes, but um, there's a lot of great research that you all are doing over there. Um, many, many important topics, uh, some of which we'll, we'll get to. So it's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, I want to start first. Uh, there's two there's two topic areas I want to um, mostly emphasize. Uh, we can talk about other things as well, but I guess the two that are most, uh, I think, prevalent for you are about female cooperation and competition and friendship. 
So is there, I'm assuming there's some overlap there at some point. Um, but um, so this is the stuff that you've been been researching. And so I guess before we jump into some of the, the details, what got you into uh, studying some of these topics about uh, female competition and cooperation and then also about friendship? I would imagine most people don't just kind of fall into it, right? There's usually some kind of an advisor had something and then you just carried it on or you went to a particular place that does this. So everyone has a different story. So how did you kind of land on these uh, topical areas? Yeah, so um, it turns out that it, uh, I think life is often much easier in some ways and maybe harder than in others when you do take an advisor's research line and extend it. Um, for me, it, it wasn't quite that way. I, um, I was trying to figure out what I loved in the world and all of that good stuff and um, uh, taking a break from, from academia. And I thought of, um, oh, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. So two of my best friends were really awful to me and they were women and I wanted to see why, basically um, what, what caused this? Mm. Um, and I couldn't make sense of it and there weren't answers. And finally, I started reading work by Nicole Hess, uh, the evolutionary anthropologist. Um, she is maybe the person who is not nearly as well known as she should be in evolutionary social science. Um, her work is amazing on informational warfare. And uh, so essentially I read Nicole's work and I thought, this makes the world make sense. I want to do this kind of work and understand the benefits of female-female cooperation as well as the costs. And I haven't looked back. So. Um, that's, I mean, again, it's just interesting how there will be some moments where or certain things that you read and it will just kind of like stay in your brain and it will stick with you and then you just kind of uh, will will just carry on with it. I, I've, I've heard that a few times from people and so it's so interesting how, how that, that can happen. Um, okay, so tell me, I guess here, what is it that is, as a starting point, um, maybe we can root this in the kind of evolutionary model, right? Because that might be helpful. So in terms of um, women interacting with other women, we can start with humans, we can talk about uh, non human animals, maybe um, as well. Um, what is what are the kind of basic features of how um, women cooperate or or do not with each other? Um, whether it's in weird cultures or non-weird weird cultures, what are kind of some of the basic principles or, or basic features that we know uh, uh, at this point? And I think uh, particularly when we think about friendship as cooperation, we have a fair amount of good data that suggests that, you know, of course, overall, the sexes are more similar than they're not. And so a lot of the features of female cooperation and friendship are going to be exactly the same or very highly similar to those of men. Uh, we like people similar to us, proximate to us, familiar to us, and that's more a social psyche thing. Um, people who benefit us and friendships are going to function to provide preferential access to emotional, social, and material support for us. And that's the same in women and in men. Um, but in general, when we start to think about the differences, um, they're in the structures, um, and that does seem to be a, a cross-cultural feature. Um, so females tend to form one or two extremely close, very deep, emotionally deep friendships with other females, whereas males tend to form more loose, multi-male groups. Um, and then we could talk about putative function and where those things might differ. So um, if, for example, men and women use their friends to solve recurrent challenges. And men and women have faced some distinct recurrent challenges like pregnancy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, then there might be some features that men and women look for to be a little different in their friends. Um, nurturance, for example, or formidability, for example. Um, so that's, that's a place we've been going. Um, and so where, where those differences seem to come into play are are in relation to that. So the, the recurrent challenges. Um, and we sort of see that. Uh, so 
there's a, re a really good stream of data with the non-human animal work and great work on chimpanzees, great work in evolutionary anthro that suggests that men band together and they engage in intergroup warfare. I, I love mythology. I love the idea of the Amazons. I love badass women, but like even the archaeological record suggests that there's nothing similar for women. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. Our friends, our allies don't function as sort of co-warriors. Um, for women... Is, is there a reason why that's not the case? And uh, there are some interesting ideas uh, in Anne Campbell's book, uh, Barbara Smuts can, uh, has talked about some of this stuff, but I don't think we could, I don't think we could say that this is why. Hmm. Um, it might just be a quirk and, and it can depend on whether we think that, you know, our uh, ancestors were more like bonobos versus chimpanzees. It's, um, it can be a slog to even talk about that stuff because we have to qualify upon qualify. Mm -hmm. But when it, it does come to women, man, um, I don't think the record is nearly as strong as to what the function is for female friends. Mm. Um, so male friends, allies, warfare, yes, among other things. Mm -hmm. Female friends, maybe replacement for kin since females left their natal area and males didn't. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Um, maybe... Having female friends helps protect you against being exploited by males, but I don't think we I don't think we have a really good idea yet. And some people would even argue that maybe female friends actually aren't more benefit than they are cost. So, mm -hmm. so sorry, I can blather about that for way too long. No, 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 it's great. It's great. I love it. So I guess my 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 first point here is so what's what's the so it seems like there are some pretty distinct sex differences on how men and women have friendships or 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 what are some of the reasons why they do that is this correct and at least on the male side we can think functionally and think about coalitions and warfare and that kind of stuff and say okay that makes a lot of sense and and maybe given some of the challenges that women are currently face like pregnancy and perhaps patrilocality then women might want some of these other things. Um, and I think we can, we can make good guesses about that. Um, and then the work on the structure of friendships seems to be, uh, at least for modern surveys across cultures, that's pretty solid. The dyadic, really close female friendships and the multi-male groups, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, so what is it, I guess, then for, for you mentioned that for, women when they have friendships it's usually um you know not as many in terms of close relationships so it's maybe one two three you know kind of close relationships but they're not having you know nine or ten but it, it does it is it signify that there's somewhat of a closer relationship they're more intimate they're sharing more of their experiences their feelings there's more of a um a kind of again a, a connection and intimacy whereas men are more um you know, based on interest or hobby or activity or some kind of goal in that way. And so maybe there's less intimacy in some ways with men that, but there's just more, uh, you know, it's higher quantity of, of, uh, friendships they have. Um, is this, is this too much of a, of a, of a, um, false dichotomy here or how, how do we understand these kinds of differences? I mean, I don't think that it's too much of one. People might say, um, so uh, Beverly Fair has a great book on friendship processes and goes over all of these. Um, so yes, there are intimacy differences in female-female versus multi-male friendships. And, but oh, maybe it's just how we define intimacy is different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, you know, really what you're saying is true. Um, women's friendships are marked by extreme self-disclosure. Um, we tell each other serious secrets and we, uh, can I say shit talk? <laughs> we, we engage yeah, in a lot yeah. of shit talk. Mm -hmm. um, gossip. Uh, our friends, gossip, yeah. yeah. And we um, will say honestly evaluative things about other people who are not present in the conversation, <laughs> all of which can be used as weapons <laughs> against us later. Um, it's, uh, it's a kind of 
um, ratcheting up of closeness akin to hostage taking in, in uh -huh. political science and that kind of work. Uh -huh. um, so we definitely see a lot of closeness, although it's a double edged sword. Uh -huh. We definitely see a lot of intimacy, um, which again can be a double edged sword uh -huh. um, in women's friendships. We also see that women's friendships and um, people might not have this in mind as much. Um, they're shorter lived women's best friendships just, are shorter they're not long term they're not we're not talking about you know long term types of friendships where it's someone that you know you you're friends with for 20 years it's a, it's a season they, it's a period they they can be and uh -huh. there are certainly those kinds of friendships absolutely uh -huh. but uh -huh. when you're looking at the averages here and this is particularly uh you know college student american samples mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those friendships are shorter lived. They are more fragile. They're more likely to experience perturbation in a shorter time than men's are. Mm -hmm. um, men are more likely to forgive and reconcile and just go on with the friendship after a uh, conflict. Um, even if they have more conflict, their relationships, their friendships are more robust. It is, um, it's a little bit of a loop in the mind. Like, what the heck is going on here, right? Yeah, well, I'm just I'm thinking about as you're discussing this. So it's one clarifying point, I think, um, mm -hmm. is th this sounds like this is on we're talking about group averages, right? We're not talking about obviously individuals We're not talking about, you know, specific people or that this is an absolute. Right. These are on group averages based on the literature we have. But how 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 I guess. Two points. But there's another main point I want to make, but I guess before that, another not disclaimer, but correcting point here is there's um, how robust is this literature? So how many years have we been looking at this? How many studies? Is there longitudinal stuff, meta analyses, etc.? And then also, um, I think I mentioned earlier is is you know is this just in in the West or with Western culture? What does this look like cross culturally? Um, in you know in in uh, in Asia and Africa and uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Oceania, all the different parts of the world, what does it look like there? So we should expect a lot of these things to vary. Um, so, for example, the fragility of relationships, right? If you're in a small community where there's low relational mobility, you you can't make a new friend easily. Mm. You're going to stay in an old friendship. So we should expect cross cultural variability. Um, at the same time, things like the uh, the longevity of friendships. Um, there have been developmental psychologists, sociologists, and others studying that for a while, and I think that is for real. Um, so uh, I. Joyce Benenson's work on this topic is amazing. Um, her book, Warriors and Warriors, uh, her 2014 book covers this beautifully. Mm. Um, so there are some things that I, I would say that seems to be the case in places that are at least westernized. Okay. But there are also, I mean, and you're, you're making this point, um, there's also so much work to be done and you would think that we would know by now if male friendships are more robust than female friendships. Um, no, we, you think we would know by now uh, uh, looking at friendships across the lifespan, right? Mm -hmm. And if these things held across the lifespan or it really is just young people where friendships are changing more often. Not really. Mm -hmm. um, there are some great studies, but uh, so if you, if particularly with respect to friendship, if you picked up one of our flagship journals in social psych or in evolutionary psych, mm -hmm. you'd be from recent years, like the last 10, 15 years, you'd be about five times more likely to read an article if you just flip to a random one on romantic relationships than on friendships. Sure. Yeah. And friendships, I mean, they're not as obviously linked to reproductive fitness, but they're tributary to reproductive fitness and, and non-human primates having a few close friends can increase your longevity and that of your offspring. Uh, I mean, but we don't know. So that's my soapbox. I'm getting off of my soapbox. That's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Um, okay. So, I mean, that's helpful. So, I mean, as it is, I think with, you know, there's, there's a few, there's, you could probably count on one hand how many of the things in 
psychological literature, we could say, yeah, we're good. We don't really have to study that much anymore on this. You know, everything needs to be studied a lot more. I think that's kind of a, uh, and they need to replicate too. So, you know, those are all those issues that are there. Fine. Okay. But I guess the, the, then the, the next question I have is with those kind of things in mind, right? So the, we're, we're talking about um, uh, in, in these types of averages, right? We're not talking about people. Obviously, some of this is more heavy in, heavily studied in the West, less so in the East or cross-culturally. Okay, fine. All that said, it doesn't mean, obviously, that this data is invalid. I mean, that's absurd. But I guess the point I'm, I'm going to say here is when you're laying out many of these things about how males have larger groups or bands of friends and women have less, I don't, I, and then you describe all of the ways in which this, uh, this um, is kind of presented, <laughs> I was listening and I was like, oh my goodness, there's like just like so many stereotypes about women that are just kind of like being checked off here of like you know they like to share feelings they like to gossip they like to hold things against each other it's just a terrible it does it's not a if you're kind of putting any any like kind of value or or you know positive or negative kind of uh spin on this it doesn't look very good it looks terrible it's, it's not a very favorable thing i mean I, what, what can we make of that so I could I could absolutely see where you'd walk away with that 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 view, but I, I will say that um, so some of these stereotypes are not correct. So for example, women don't talk more than men. Mm -hmm. um, women might gossip more than men as a form of indirect aggression um, against. Well, so when women are aggressing against other women, they overwhelmingly prefer to use. Um, tactics of aggression that are sort of covert and subtle that might be less likely to uh, evoke retaliation from targets or other people compared to men. Um, and men can benefit from using direct tactics of aggression, like punching each other. Um, but men gossip probably about as much as women do. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is in direct aggression. Mm. And uh, men do fight with their friends more it's just i think women are more sensitive to these things so it does come off and it can come off as stereotypes absolutely and um in some data i have with a graduate student i work with crystal duarte um we see that men and women both have pretty accurate ideas about um women's friendships seem to be closer men's friendships seem to have more conflicts, but be more robust. Mm. So not just not them reporting on their own friendships, but what they think about male versus female friendships. Mm. So these things are at once true, but a little more nuanced than just stereotypes. And mm. I think, uh, so there's this notion, right? Like women can't be friends with one another actually they're just really catty and they don't they can't really have friends with the friendship with one another and it's a very like even aristotelian kind of thing women aren't really friends with one another mm. you have that stereotype but at the same time you also have the stereotype that women's friendships are only like they're the paradigm of friendship because they're so close and they're so open and they're so mm. intimate so I think even then we can have two stereotypes that are absolutely conflictual. Um, and probably the reason that we have them is that women's friendships are rife with paradoxes. There's, they are more emotionally close and intimate than men's, but they're also shorter lived. They are overtly egalitarian. You are not allowed to compete with your friends. And if you do, we don't want you to be our friend. And yet they're also competitive because competition is useful. They're just covertly competitive and so and no wonder we have sort of paradoxical stereotypes we take away from that so this is maybe a little bit of a finer point here so you're you're talking so again to be clear to listeners so we're talking about the differences between mm -hmm. how uh, traditionally men and women will have relationships and friendships in this case now this might be i have a feeling i know what you're going to tell me but i'm going to ask anyways it, is this something to do with the gender? Like, is this what's making the difference? So there's a, so this is a little bit of a nuance here, but yes, there are differences between groups of, of people, genders, okay, fine. That, some people may resist that or push against that, okay. But let's say most people don't, fine. 
But I guess the thing that most people may resist is, well, you're telling me that this is because they're women or because they're men. Is it, is it that the gender piece, is that what's causing the difference or are there other, is this a kind of multivariate kind of uh, answer here? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I don't think that there is a definitive answer to that, which is- I, like I thought you might say that. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so many of these things are associated with sex slash gender. Um, if we took women and put them um, in a, an atmosphere where they had to, you know, form coalitions and compete, uh, do some of the, the traditionally historically male friendship jobs, then maybe we would see that more. Um, then again, maybe not. Um, maybe, you know, our, our, our stone aged brains are uh, just not calibrated to. So there's work by Amanda Rose, for example, a developmental psychologist, trying to figure out um, why aren't men talking to each other the way that women are? Like, they can. Sometimes they talk to their partners th that way, particularly cis heterosexual men talking to their female partners, um, their, their women partners. So we see men do this. We know there are huge benefits to things like self-disclosure. Why aren't men doing this with one another? And in general, the answer that she gets is that they just don't want to. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a motivational component. Is that motivational component traceable back to, you know, gametes and socialization? Uh, it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. I could have just given you the answer that you thought I was going to say. Which is like, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I had a feeling that's what it would be, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, this is probably something I should have started with. So I, I'll just ask it here just so I don't forget. Um, how do we typically define friendship? Now, I'm sure if you ask 20 people, you get 20 different definitions. But how do you, how do you, how do we typically define what a friend is and is not? Is is this a, a a very, is this a too abstract theoretical kind of question that again is just too varied, or is there kind of like a I don't want to say scientific answer, but is there like a kind of standard answer for how friendship is defined? There's not a standard one. Um, I would say that for most purposes, we can think about friendship. So you're right. First of all, if you ask 20 different friendship researchers, you're going to get 20 different answers, maybe 25 different answers. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but medium to long term mutualistic or communal affiliative relationships between conspecifics, uh, members of the same species. So that. Um, I think you can include uh, for most of the work on humans um, that they are not kin, so genetically unrelated, uh, particularly in the non-human animal literature, um, depending on how you define friendship, kin can be friends. Um, and then often in, in my work, you know, um, I'll say it's, it's not purely an exchange relationship. And it's non-romantic uh, so that we can sort of isolate the affiliative from any of the romantic or reciprocal. Mm. Okay. All right. So it seems like a fair definition, I think. I mean, you know, I think probably most people would have something similar, right? I mean, maybe they might change the words or there's some, some, many of those aspects are probably in someone's working definition of friendship. I think so. Uh, they'd probably say, you know, people I like who like me back and are similar to me. Um, right. Right. Things, they say um, somebody who is nice, uh, what they mean is nice to them. Uh, somebody who plays with me and uh, somebody who is not aggressive toward me. And then as adults, our relationships are, are uh, definitions, excuse me, just tend to get wordier, but are basically the same. Yeah. 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 So now is, are there, um, it, I don't want to say, I guess, a taxonomy of it, but are there levels or dimensions of friendship? So friendship as a, as a broad term mm -hmm. um, is, you know, okay, we, we have some under, understanding of that. But what about different types of friends? So not even, not even saying qualitatively per se, although you guess you could put that in there, but more so of, well, this is an acquaintance 
This mm-hmm. is a friend. This is a best friend, a good friend. Um, s- something like, along those lines. You know, this is a long-term friend. This is someone I just met five minutes ago. You know, what are the kind of dimensions or layers or levels of friendship, I guess, that have, uh, I guess, been um, organized or developed some kind of system in that way? Yeah, so, I mean... The number of social relationships that we can maintain at any one time, even with social media, is limited. Mm. Um, And from that starting point, um, or from his work on the social brain, uh, Robin Dunbar, who's at Oxford, and full disclosure, a former advisor of mine from when I was there, um, he would view um, there as there to be sort of like a bullseye. So you have your really close friends and there are about five of them. And they are the people that if you had a crisis, you could turn to them immediately. You're ride or die. That's, yes. that's those people. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the ones that know where all the bodies are hid, hidden and they're going to cover it up with you. Yes. I, uh-huh. I, mean, like, I, I love those people. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I hope you're listening back. Uh, so... You would have those. Um, now, in that view, it, they're not just friends the way that we designed them. They could be, you know, a romantic partner would be included in their parents sometimes. Mm. And then you have a sort of um, expanding groups from there. So you have about five in your ride or die. And then you have about 15. And then maybe you have about 50. And then your social network is 150 people, Dunbar's number. The number of people you, um, if you met them or saw them out at a coffee shop, the number of people you'd feel comfortable just sitting down and having a conversation with. So, so it's not quite necessarily on the on the on the on the fringes of that. It's not just do I know you. So, for example, um, if if I'm out and about, and you know, uh, let's say you know. Washington DC or Baltimore or Philadelphia or whatever big city and I bump into at a coffee shop uh somebody I went to undergrad with 45 million years ago and we weren't ever friends then we have never talked to each other since but I remember that we had whatever we had history of civilization or whatever it was together. He sat in the back, I sat in front of him and you know, he helped me out on an assignment one time or something like that. I don't know. Like that's not a friendship, right? Just because there's a point of contact does not mean that they're necessarily a friend. There's there. That's a, they're not even an acquaintance of sorts. There's so on that like 150 limit or boundary, folks like that wouldn't be included there have to be some kind of like exchange or a period or some sort or how, how would it kind of work on the fringes so the 150 is your social network number basically um there are people in there that are probably much closer to acquaintances like that somebody you know you'd okay. say hi um okay. but in terms of friends yeah it's i mean uh, probably one maybe two people in your really close bullseye ride or die bullseye Mm -hmm. and then generally as you move out those are friends in the 15 group Mm -hmm. and then in the 50 group i think those are generally friends work buddies etc and as you get larger it's uh people who are more distant you know maybe we call them friends um Uh Uh and uh, it it does seem like there's obviously there are shades there but When it comes to who gets in and who gets out, um, it's not just friends. So uh, Mm, mm. Robin has some really cool stuff. So he has a new book out on friends that's amazing, I should say. Nice. Um, And I think Nicole Barbero is reading it or is going to read it. um, And I look for her book reviews. Um, But uh, he would say that, so for example, when you make a new romantic relationship, it takes up so much of your time and energy and brain space that it ends up relegating two of your rider dies to the outer layer, the next outer layer, because you only have so much time and energy and brain space for these people in each layer. Mm-hmm. So that's what the, the layers are sort of about, about in his view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, no, that, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. 
So I guess a, a little bit more nuanced here. This is more on the kind of, I guess you could say, intersubjective or interpersonal kinds of uh, uh, points here. So <clears throat> two things, uh, I guess, kind of closely associated. So the first thing is, what about people that, for various reasons, maybe they have a really tough uh, um, family unit or childhood experiences or whatever, and they're just not close with their family, maybe for very negative reasons, <clears throat> or in some cases, if people are adopted or if they were orphans or things like that. I mean, it could be other things like that too, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be maybe they have a very small family or they... They're just not very close. They're just, you know, not very close with family. And, and is there a kind of, you kind of were hinting at it, I think, but there's, is there kind of association where people will say, well, my friends are my family because I have such a small family or I don't have, you know, I come from this kind of background or these experiences. So they put maybe um, more um, qualitative, um, maybe let's say assurance or attachment or, um, and an energy. necessity be in friends or in friend groups or whatever, because that replaces or mm, is a type of surrogate for family, their concept of family. What do we understand about these kinds of uh, ideas? Yeah. So, I mean, we see this a lot uh, in the LGBTQ community, mm, talk about sure. who's in family, right? Sure, sure. Um, and so these people can do a lot of the same things that family can do for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, genetically related family, all of those interactions are underlain by R or relatedness. And so if I help my sister, I kind of halfway help myself because we're 50% right. related to each other. Right. So that kind of um, kin selection and, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have that with friends. Um, what you do have is something perhaps like interdependence. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, if something good happens to you, maybe that's good for me. Mm -hmm. um, and what's nice about a measure of something like interdependence like that is that um, so R goes from zero to one. Mm -hmm. uh, interdependence can be zero, just stranger, whomever, mm -hmm. whatever you do doesn't affect me. Um, it can be really high and positive. So um, if something good happens to my best friend, something good might happen to me. Right. Um, and it can also be negative. So I can have an enemy, which we don't typically talk about, but should be talking about when it comes to sociality. Um, and if something good happens to my enemy, that could be bad for me. Mm. Mm. It's interesting because I think many people will say, like, you know, these you know, friends are my family, or or they'll have a, a higher, uh, not status, but a, just somewhere higher on the, on the order of things of, yeah, I have my family, but they all suck. So I'd rather, I, I'd rather invest or put more time into my friends more than my family because they're maybe abusive or um, they're, uh, they're not there for me or et cetera. You can find different reasons for this. Um, do we find that as well, where people are putting more higher qualitative kinds of attributions with friends, even if they have a nuclear family or, or maybe extended family or whatever, that it doesn't, the relatedness thing isn't for some people, if they're willing to do it, doesn't really matter. It could be like, yeah, you are blood related, but you suck. So I'd rather put more time and energy and investment into my friends who are there no matter what. And you haven't been, do we see that too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so two things there. Um, one is that people can choose to do that and get benefits that way. Um, and they certainly don't, they don't have to keep up a kin relationship the same way that they have to put time and energy into not just forming, but also maintaining a friendship. So the amount of time and energy it takes to uh, form and maintain a kin relationship is much, much less than that it takes to form and maintain a, a, a friendship. So uh, Jeffrey Hall has some work that suggests it takes about 200 hours to make a close friendship. Mm. Kin, you know, you're born and you're kin. And then, you know, you can call once a year and you're still related. 
Um, with some people, it can be that way with their friendships. Um, mm -hmm. my, my guess is that's probably more frequently true. So there's probably a critical period for that where you grow up together. Mm -hmm. And probably it's more true of men than women, but that could be a mistake. Um, it could be <laughs> anecdotally what we find is that um, maybe men just sort of have that more often in their lives because they don't, they still consider people they are not in touch with friends. Whereas for women, the tail end of their relationships are not, it's not just sort of fade to black, it's an acrimonious split. Uh, so. so I guess on that piece of things, what do we, what do we know about, I guess this kind of goes to the different kind of shades or, or layers of friendship, but you'll have different types of friends. So not talking about qualitatively types. Of, so you, let's say, let's say someone has three friends, let's just say, yeah. and they are really close to each one of them in different ways, you know, they share a lot, you know, when they make mistakes, when they fail, when they have successes and glories and good times and bad times, whatever, right? Really close, really you know, share life experiences, big moments. And for whatever reason, there's, let's say one friend who moves away and they don't talk as much. And then there's another friend that um, they just start to drift apart, even though they still live close together, but, you know, maybe different interests or you know, different life changes, et cetera. And then there's the other friend that kind of just stays there constant. <clears throat> but there's always a possibility, though, where people will have friendships for a season and then they don't, right? So maybe it's you meet someone at work and you're really close, you work together, you hang out, you know, uh, off hours doing barbecues and, you know, going places and whatever. And then as soon as one person quits the job, well, there's just not as much closeness there because of proximity and time and all that doesn't mean that there's anything acrimonious about the relationship. It's just, you know, a lot of the pragmatics, uh, or you'll see people that they don't talk to someone for years and they were really close. Let's say they were close at grad school and then they don't talk for years. They go, they do their life, get married, have kids or not, or whatever. And then they come back into each other's lives at a different period. And then they just, you know, pick it right up. All of these nuances, how, how does this impact, I guess, people or maybe in terms of some of the, the, I guess, the differences between men and women of how they view these kinds of things? Having a friend for a season and maybe never again, or maybe they do again. How do we, is this just kind of start to dip into some of like personality kinds of differences that some people might be okay with this, other people may not? Or what can we say, I guess, at the group level? I mean, the the short answer is we don't effing know. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the slightly more nuanced answer is that um, there are some really amazing, strong, robust, interesting findings in the romantic relationships or mating literature, including things like uh, sociosexuality. So um, whether you are relatively more committed and you just want one partner and you sleep with that partner when you're in a committed monogamous relationship versus you want to be a little less committed and be a bit of a sexual social butterfly to yeah. be really colloquial about it. Yeah. So um, we probably have that for friends too. And maybe, you know, what we call openness or extroversion is related to that. Um, but we, we don't know if we have a friend sociosexuality and maybe, uh, Jessica Ayers, who's a, a grad student at ASU is, is doing this. We've talked about it for ages. Um, we don't know if men and women necessarily use their friends differently in these ways either in terms of for a season. So, um, it seems like from pilot data from a woman named Elaine Perea, who was a grad student at ASU before I got there. Uh, that when women have different challenges that they face, they'll take their best friend and they will use that best friend to face all of the challenges with, with them. When men have, uh, men name their friends and they have different challenges that they face, they use their friends uh, differently. So they'll have one friend for basketball, one friend for a wingman, one friend for study buddy. Um, they sort of use the best man for the job. Whereas for women, 
the best man for the job is the best friend and for any job. Um, and these, these are things that we have preliminary data to hint at or anic data to mm -hmm. talk about, mm -hmm. but they haven't been extremely well studied and certainly not outside the U.S. Mm. Interesting. Well, Frustrating. It, it, well, yeah, frustrating too. Well, I'm just going to say for any grad students that are out there, there's so much stuff to look at and research. So that's always exciting in that front. But it is. Uh, it is. I guess uh, I want to come back to the using of people because I, I think that's interesting. But before there, so I've talked with many people uh, in clinical practice and my personal life, things like that. And I hear this thing sometimes. And so we can, we can introduce, we can make this more complicated, introduce another concept here um, is about jealousy. Okay. Oh, like jealousy yeah. and friendships is wild. It is absolutely wild. Right. Okay. So maybe we can do some, some preliminary stuff on jealousy as an emotion first, cause that's really, really uh, instructive. But I guess my question here is this, how does jealousy, this is, I'll just make it general. How does jealousy kind of show up or present itself in friendship as opposed to jealousy in uh, a committed monogamous romantic relationship and or you know family or things like that i guess that's a general question uh so maybe we can just start with that so uh i think first we have to say jealousy and envy are two separate things and envy is a two-person emotion i want something you have um because they when people talk about jealousy and friends and colloquially we we use those interchangeably sometimes but envy is i want something you have jealousy is a three-person emotion i am afraid that i'm going to lose my valued partner to someone else so and envy is you have an original record of the beatles white album and i yes. really want that Okay, I would go with your Martin Screlly and you don't deserve to have that Wu-Tang album and I want to listen to it, but yes. <laughs> okay, but the envy is you have something I want. Exactly, yeah. Jealousy is, what's the, diff what's the main difference? Jealousy is I'm worried that I'm going to lose something I have to someone. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, so somebody... I'm worried you're going to come in the middle of the night and with a mask on, break into my house and steal the White Album because you know I have it now. So uh, Some kind I would of loss say uh, I'm jealousy is is the sort of it feels like some melange of anxiety and sadness and maybe anger, betrayal mm. to the extent that that's an emotion. People mm. have, have used that as part of the phenomenology of it. Mm -hmm. But um, somebody likes my partner. Or I, I perceive whether it's really perceived. I perceive that somebody likes my partner, whether mm. it's my best friend or my mate. Um, and I'm worried that, okay, maybe there's something there, or, or mm -hmm. I think my partner likes someone else more than me, mm -hmm. and I might lose them mm -hmm. to this other mm -hmm. person. So mm -hmm. uh, in, in a lot of clinical views, at least, jealousy like that would be considered a, a clinically maladaptive emotion. And um, even in a lot of the literature, almost exclusively developmental literature, on jealousy and friendships, um, it would be considered, uh, <laughs> okay, so if you feel jealous when your friend makes a new friend, uh -huh. one, um, <laughs> you are abnormally developing or something's wrong with you in that way. Uh, so the editor, co-editor of the Norton book on friendship with Eudora Welty would mm -hmm. say that like, well, you just don't understand what friendship is, bro. Uh -huh. um, probably wouldn't say bro, but if you don't understand what friendship is. It isn't the zero something. People don't get replaced. Affection is infinite, which is BS. It's not true, but that's what one would say. Mm -hmm. um, other work uh, draws from really interesting stuff by Selman and colleagues. Um, and it says, well, no, no, no. You just, you're abnormally developing. You know, it's not that you're just wrong about friendship, but you know, you're supposed to grow up and realize that no one friend or person can meet all of your interpersonal needs. Right. This isn't sixth grade, right? We don't stay in middle school as we grow up, right? We maybe that's somewhat developmentally appropriate in sixth grade, maybe, mm -hmm. but not at not in your junior year of undergrad. So I I would disagree. Okay. Um, I would say that. Feelings of jealousy in adults are pretty normal. Um, we yes. see them across cultures. 
Uh -huh. So in friendship, not just romantic relationships. So we see reports of them in ethnographies across cultures. We see um, uh, historical writings across eras. And what's really cool to my mind is that we see in non-human animals behavior consistent with feelings of friendship jealousy. So um, Mustangs, female Mustangs will form really close dyadic friendships. Mm -hmm. And if another female tries to get with their best friend, they'll bite and kick that poacher female. Because they don't want to lose. Yeah, uh -huh. they don't they don't want to lose their best friend. Right. And so if we see this across cultures, across eras and across species, if it's so conserved, why, natural selection wouldn't let something that's so maladaptive continue. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have it. And so what's the functional explanation? Well, it might be negative to experience, but it's probably beneficial to feel jealousy when somebody might threaten to take your best friend and then act in ways that mitigate that possibility so that you can maintain that friendship, maintain that relationship and continue to enjoy all the benefits of it. The difference between kids and adults is that kids probably react to that jealousy in pretty poor ways. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they'll bite or kick like horses, um, <laughs> poacher. whereas adults probably have developed some more subtle and potentially even beneficial uh, ways of going about meeting that threat. Um, maybe we're just really nice to our friends or maybe we openly say, hey, I really value you. It sucks that you're not spending time with me anymore. So the counter to this is I agree with you. I definitely think that I, I don't see emotion. I've talked about this so many times at this point i don't see emotions as positive or negative i think that's yeah. bullshit um <clears throat> i see them as sort of neutral in some ways i think they can have different types of valence as we would say but it, this idea of like good and bad emotions is garbage um i think that there are emotions that aren't nice to experience as you're saying but i think most emotions uh, or all emotions have an ad adaptive utility they have an adaptive function they're helping us survive so to say that one's this is a bad emotion is is at the very least imprecise but and and and, and this would obviously be true of jealousy mm -hmm. and so the counter i could hear is well if you're not jealous you just don't care about me that much then right <laughs> You don't care. Like if, 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 if we're not going to be friends or you're not going to, you know, date me or whatever the relationship is. And you're just like, oh, yeah, I don't mind if you talk to somebody else in a platonic or non-platonic way. Um, you know, that's fine. I'm just not jealous. And be like, well, hey, like you don't care that I could just maybe not talk to you anymore. Or we're not going to be in any kind of whatever kind of relationship it is. I could see that being a counter. Right. Or that could be used negatively or in some ways i don't want to say manipulatively but negatively and uh manipulative in the same way of like functional emotions it's, it's, and that's what it does right mm -hmm. not manipulative as in like negative and sneaky yeah um but i mean i think you're right and what that would suggest is that we give jealousy this horrible rap mm -hmm. um and people are ashamed to even admit that they feel it sometimes mm -hmm. but a they feel it and B, they want other people to feel it. Mm -hmm. So if my partner, uh, if my best friend were jealous that I started hanging out with somebody else more, um, I might be flattered by that. Mm -hmm. So, and again, it would probably depend on the way that that jealousy were instantiated. So if they're slashing my tires, not so much. <laughs> yeah, not cool. Yeah, yeah. If they say, you know, Jamie, I really just miss hanging out or talking on the phone. How come we're not doing that? Um, I might feel really flattered that they value me that much. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a huge part of the the function of friendship, like what friendship is for and about, um, it, it's value. Mm -hmm. So we can get into the banker's paradox and the alliance hypothesis of friendship and all. And I, I, I will try not to unless you want me to. But if you value me, you're valuable to me. And so you saying that you're jealous that you might lose me tells me that you value me, which can make you more valuable to me. Yes. So you can explain the, the, the paradox and everything. I don't mind you doing that. But I guess one point there, I guess, before you do that is. Does it depend on what your value is? 
right? So values are, well, this is more of the philosophy of it, but I don't think that there's universal values uh, uh, inherently. Now, I, that, that's not to say that people don't have similar values mm -hmm. across the world and across cultures and all that stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that, but I don't think in actuality, in the thing of itself, there's a universality to that. But what is it? So let me make this specific. If, if there's someone that says, hey, I want to spend time with you or I want to hang out with you as a friend or in other contexts, but since we're talking about friends, wanting to be motivated to do that. And that can be shown and evidenced behaviorally and with actions in different ways. You call, you hang out, you make attempts, you this, you that, whatever. Implicit in that is, well, I value, like I'm going to take my time and energy to mm -hmm. spend with you because I value something about you, right? Mm -hmm. um, whatever it may be. But what, what is the value? Is it just the person? Is it their personality? Is it the fact that, you know, they drive a Tesla and I like to ride in it? Is it the fact that every time we go out, they always pay for lunch? Is it, what is it? Um, obviously, it's going to be different for each relationship. But how can we understand what that value is of what people are looking for in friendships? So, I mean, I guess I would say I don't know if we have to, right? Okay. We can think of people as collections of affordances, uh, opportunities and threats. Um, and particularly opportunities and threats potentially are likely to be posed to me. So yeah, they might have a Tesla and that could be cool if I want to go driving fast. Um, uh, but they might have a, a you know, really good eye for typos, which I, I would find very valuable. And so if they pose things, to, uh, affordances to me, benefits to me, um, I, I don't think we can get to the level of what those are and what we should think that those would be anything from beauty to formidability to intelligence to kindness or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it, if we need to look there, we need to look at the level of, I value the collection of stuff that you are. Well, I think, I think it does matter. I, well, so, okay. I think I agree with you. And then, and then I also think that it's, it, it, it can be that. So yes, I think sometimes it's just like, yeah, we're friends. I value you as a person. You have things to offer, costs, benefits, et cetera. You use me, I use you, whatever. That, that, that happens. But I do think people often enough, that's not enough where it's like, well, I need to know that it's real. Mm -hmm. I need to know that you're authentically about, it's about me, not the fact that Hey, every time you call me, it's just so I can edit your papers for you. I mean, come on, Jamie, you can hire an editor or something. I mean, and pay them and all that. You're just friends with me because you just want me to just fix your typos. That's terrible. That's all the reason you're friends with me. It's like, yeah, I bet you do value me, don't you? Right? Like, you know, it could have something like that if people feel it's not authentic or insincere or that they're being used. No? Yeah. Uh, so here's what I would say, and, and bear with me for a second. Um, I think. The, this it's really interesting to have these conversations and they're they are very similar to a lot of the conversations that um, are in the friendship literature already so we like people who are similar to us um, we want to be closer to people uh, our partner satisfaction matters and all of these things sort of view a friendship as existing in a vacuum so there's you and there's me and we're a dyad and that's what matters. And do you think I'm authentic? Do you authentically like me? Um, but if we zoom out for a second, we realize that the like, actual ecology of any dyadic friendship, it's embedded in a much wider and densely interconnected social network where my friend is going to be frequently interacting with a lot of other people, not just me, and how they treat me relative to those other people is I think a huge factor here that matters maybe more than, uh, so that might lead into feelings of you authentically value me because you pick me over these other people. Mm -hmm. But I think once we realize that friendship isn't just a two person game, it's a, an N person game and you can spend time with me 
it's not you can spend time with me or not. It's you can spend time with me or not or anybody else. And you are spending time with me. I think that's the value. Uh, clearly, you value me, or at least you value me more than you value these other options. Did that make any sense? No, I make, I know it makes great. You're bringing you're bringing another. This, this is where these things start to go. <laughs> it's just funny. It, it makes perfect sense. So because my brain is so clinical psych, right? That's how I see see things. I'm looking at it on like the one to one level, and you're looking at it in social. <laughs> groups which makes sense obviously right and i think both are true now so like yeah. in your example of course there's a complete social context here right mm -hmm. which is yes it's the one-to-one -one between you and i but that's the backdrop with that is i'm doing this with you whatever we're doing hanging out spending time whatever and not doing it with other people or other people are seeing that we are doing this or that we have a kind of context or something like that and that is an, an uh, important backdrop there, right? Because it's not just an isolation or in a vacuum. Totally agree with you on that. So I guess the other thing I would, I guess, ask here on that point is how much of that then, when you're looking at a uh, friendship, let's say between two people, becomes um, a type of uh, signaling or a type of status or things like that. And you still have the authenticity question. So for example, <clears throat> now this is, a, this is a little bit fuzzy because of many things, right? Cause I always question people's, um, sincerity when they're uh, in front of something, right? So for example, this is why I don't watch reality TV. Cause I don't believe any of it. It's all bullshit to me. It's all like, yes, there's 20 cameras and they're looking at you. Sure. That's reality. Like I just, I don't buy it and I can't watch it. If everything on reality TV was hitting cameras, I would totally watch it. Cause I could believe it, but that doesn't happen. Right. It's like, yeah, everyone's wearing a microphone. They're doing it up for the camera and they know it's a TV show, blah, blah, blah. I don't buy it. Minus the first seasons of The Real Housewives of New Jersey and some of New York, I completely agree with you. Yeah, or I think I'm going to really date myself here, but like if you look at like the first Survivor show or whatever it was, like maybe the first one on the island, like it was a whole new thing. And like, yeah, it was being filmed, but like how real, how wasn't it, you know, whatever. Maybe in the early days it was that way, but now, yeah, everything's so maybe like the first couple seasons of The Housewives. Just, they're so enjoyable and ridiculous and. I but it's not it's, real. I can't. I, I, yeah. I, I, I can't. I just can't. I Which is fine saying. because I could. I I love sci-fi and fantasy, and that. I, but I know that, and 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 when it's being made, it's known that like Middle Earth doesn't exist. So I don't have to think about is this real or not. With things that are trying to pretend it's real, but we know it isn't. I just can't get over it in my head. But that's that's just <laughs> that's just me though. Okay. Say, oh, Go ahead. Sorry. No, ahead. You might find this funny. I went to. Bryn Mawr, a women's college in the uh -huh. North East, mm -hmm. um, and uh, like, we're serious nerds there. And I definitely overheard someone once say, um, oh, I'm just, uh, I can't make it. I'm working on my Klingon to Middle English dictionary. <laughs> uh, okay. I miss those people. That was a serious nerd alert. That's great. <laughs> I love them. Anyway, all right. About, so, so about the, the whole like, in terms of showing like status and or how things are, if if I tell people online, so if I tell people on Twitter, hey, uh, Jamie and I are really good friends, mm -hmm. and then you and then people see that you comment on my post, I comment on your post. It's always usually pretty positive. You know, I share things that you do, research you do, you share things I do, I write, you know, whatever my my podcast episodes. And there's a there's a signaling that's going on. Now, I don't think of it that way, right? I I try to be sincere when I say things. And if I don't say something, it's because I don't want to or I don't want to get involved or whatever, right? And I think a lot of people operate that way. And there are people that don't operate that way and probably should online, <laughs> right? right? So, but there's a, there, there is a type of signaling there. Hey, and again, that's not my main motivation. That's not why I do it. I'm usually not aware of it when I'm doing it, but that's probably unconscious or some in the background. Hey, I want people to know that we're cool and we're friends. And it's not like, oh, she, we just kind of know each other. Like we, you know, 
when when i when i'm uh, in your neck of the woods we go and we have you know coffee or we go and we have you know a beer or something like that like we're really friends irl right we're not just like online <laughs> you know there's a type of signal there right yeah. and isn't that also a way of like yes friendships don't operate in a vacuum and yes there's a social context but you could still have where people are doing it up more than what it actually is there is still a, a, a kind of way in which it could still be inauthentic or insincere and doesn't that take a little bit out of the i guess the the the, the quality of the relationship or no is that is that too much of my value judgment no I, I mean i think if you know that somebody is using you for your like, follower count or something and i'm mm -hmm. sure it's like four times what mine is because i'm not good at twitter no um, i don't have a big i don't have a big following count and that's very fine with me <laughs> so let's just all say we want nicole barbero's follower count i'm sure yes 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 and um so if you know that somebody is uh using you to get your goodies then of course you're gonna feel like that relationship is um less truly close they want yeah. something from you they don't want they don't value you they value the thing they can get via you right right very nakedly. you're just a conduit yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i i think that when that is clear of course that can diminish relationships and i think that could even break relationships a lot of mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. um it doesn't mean though that the relationship if you incidentally get that or that's a benefit you can mm. enjoy mm -hmm. it doesn't mean the relationship is necessarily um uh, an inauthentic relationship but mm -hmm. um so say like say we were best friends right and uh somebody that like my 10th ranked friend or something mm -hmm. went to you and was like wow did you hear that jamie has this horrible medical issue and you, I did. I hadn't told you. But you, you told that person. Yeah. Oh, uh, pissed! I'd right? be pissed off. Yes. yes. I thought we were close. What? Yeah. You didn't tell me something serious? How dare you? And immediately, like our our intuitions are thinking about this is an n person game. Here is a three person game. Look, you must have valued that person more than me, but I'm higher up here. Right. And we give each other benefits. And so right. I think we there are so many things that we immediately intuit, including whether or not somebody is trying to use us or like game us to get other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we're if we're aware of it uh, and it's just sort of incidental and whatever, but if we are consciously pursuing a relationship with this person to get more followers then yeah that person might feel a little bit used and like it's not really a friendship it's an instrumental or an exchange relationship mm -hmm. um, so uh another hypothetical we're best friends we go to starbucks um you buy me my drink because i can't find my wallet right that second and as we're leaving, um, you hand me my drink and I hand you exact change. I'm like, oh, here, take this. This is exactly the change. Um, <laughs> it's kind of offensive and shitty, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is more indicative of a, an exchange relationship than a friendship right. where we are account keeping. Yes. Uh, yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have the tick mark somewhere and, and you're holding it over their head. Maybe you don't say it. But you say, yeah, 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 it's totally fine. And then you like very much to the T. Yeah. But, but there is, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, that's hard, right? Because there, there's a lot of things in the mix with that where it's like, I've, I've had this conversation with people numerous times where it's like, if somebody, when, when you, it's hard to explain because there's so many variables. Money to me, is 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 i mean it really is actually but then psychologically is just representations right mm -hmm. there's the actual piece of it but like you know money is 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 a representation of trust security you know whatever right okay stability in some ways okay and so if someone asks you for money and you or they don't ask you but mm -hmm. they're kind of asking you without explicitly asking you oh i just don't know how i'm going to pay this and 
I don't know. And what would you do? And blah, blah, blah. And oh, yeah. And, and then they wait for the person to say, well, I got you. I can help you out. It's only X, Y, and Z amount. Sometimes it's a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the kind of the, the, the quality of the relationship. Am I going to ask um, my coworker from two jobs ago? Probably not. Am I going to ask my dad or my mom? Yeah, probably. Um, or et cetera. But then people will start to say, depending on the amount, right? Let's say the person has the money. They're going to want to know, okay, wait a minute. Over $200, I kind of need to know where this is going. If it's 50 bucks, I don't care, whatever. There's a, and that's different for everybody. And then, and then it's the, the pattern of it, the frequency. You're yeah. hitting me up every month. Hey, I need 20 bucks. Hey, I need $100. Hey, I need $50, you know, or, or larger. Then that becomes another thing. Right. And so I, money or, or even other types of things, favors or things like that in friendships, it can get really, it, everyone's value is a little bit different on this, but that can also, I think, poison the well sometimes, no? Yeah. So I, I think, um, and there's just a really incredible paper by Peter DeSholey, who's a political science guy at Stony Brook, who you should absolutely talk to. Mm -hmm. And um, his old advisor and one of my former advisors, Robert Kurzban, on the alliance hypothesis of friendship. And then at the back end and a little bit in the intro of this paper, they're talking about um, the difference between our rules for exchange relationships and our rules for friendships. Mm. And the it gets muddy because we have sort of a, a cognitive mechanisms to deal with things like trust and loyalty in our friendships. Mm -hmm. We have very different ones when it comes to exchange relationships. Our cheater detection mechanisms go off in exchange relationships in ways that they don't in our communal friendships. And mm -hmm. I think probably a lot of the discomfort that you're describing comes from the fact that we don't know which of these rules we're supposed to be using right now. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, my, uh, so with Daniel Sneezer, um, my mm -hmm. graduate student, Laurie and Murray is uh, doing this incredible stuff on trust. Mm. And most people are like, trust is one thing. Like it's trust. I trust you or, or I don't, but how many times have your friends talked shit to you about your other friends? Oh yeah. And you that still, happens. Yeah, and you still trust the shit talking friend, right? Well, it's a different relationship. Yeah, and they like you clearly. They like <laughs> you more than the person <laughs> they're talking shit on. And so, right. one of the one of the studies um, explores exactly that. So, uh, people are randomly assigned to one of four vignettes where they yeah. imagine that um, they are either uh, the person who is. Um, a secret is being betrayed to them mm. or a secret is being betrayed to a third party and they're just viewing it or, you know, the same information comes out, but there's no betrayal. The person that could betray the secret doesn't do it. Mm. And so if trust were just one thing and it weren't this sort of confluence of friend relationships and alliances, and maybe we have a different one for exchange relationships, if it were just one thing, then we would not trust the betrayers, uh, or we would not trust the betrayers and we would trust the non-betrayers, hmm. right? Um, or if it's just about favoritism um, and that you value me and you've given me a cue that you value me, then if you spill the beans to me, then yeah, I'm gonna trust you. But if you don't spill the beans to me, I'm not. And what we see is that the, the data seem to suggest that in that situation, which is, I think, pretty similar to the situation of, of mixing exchange relationship rules and loyalty mm -hmm. rules, um, mm -hmm. people trust the betrayer, the non-betrayers most and equally. Like if you don't betray to me and you don't betray to a third party, I just read a story that you don't tell somebody secret to somebody else. But in the situations where the person does betray the secret, um, if you betray the secret to me, so in my favor, and you help me, I trust you a little bit more than if you don't. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes sense. And I think it gets back to these ideas that, you know, we have these sort of mental rules for friends and we have mental rules for exchange. And when they 
overlap, it's terrifyingly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine that there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that's going on where it's like, I don't know which rules to follow. I have two sets of rules and it's for the same person. Which one do I do? And I can't really mix them and maybe people try to, but um, I want to, I want to go back to the, the jealousy piece thing again, just one last yeah. bit on that, which was something I've heard a lot is somebody will be friends with somebody <clears throat> and one of the friends will get married mm -hmm. or, or, or though, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, that's a pretty big life change, but it could be that, or sometimes it's just, they'll find a, a partner, mm -hmm. you know, romantic partner interest. And the friendship gets put on the bench. It's the B team. Sorry. You know, and people will, the, the friend that's getting put on the bench will feel aggrieved. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that, I mean, there's some element of that, I guess is fair, but how much of that is just on personality differences? Because I think you could find a variety of people that would say, yeah, sure. I get it. Yeah. You got to put more time into a new relationship. It's a different type of relationship. Um, or especially if you get married, I mean, that's a lifelong commitment, blah, blah, blah. You know, of course, you're not going to be spending more time with a friend than you would your husband, right. wife, whatever, whatever partner, right? But some people really can't get there. They can't, it doesn't, doesn't matter. We are, <laughs> we've always been friends. It has to be the same type of frequency, intensity, whatever. I don't care who you're with. And, and so, I don't know, is that kind of a personality difference thing there? Or, or, or what do we know about jealousy and friendships when they're replaced by uh, <laughs> another person but like it's an understandable like replacement yeah. i guess yeah so um we've actually done some studies uh large end studies where we'll ask participants to imagine that your best friend became potentially closer with his new romantic partner than he is with you mm -hmm. um imagine your best friend became potentially closer with the same sex stranger than he is with you and people assume that best friends are going to spend more time with new romantic partners than with new friends. And so that is uh -huh. something, right? Mm -hmm. Romantic partners take up more time. Mm -hmm. um, but they do fulfill some distinct functions for your friend compared to the functions that you do. So for example, you probably don't sleep with your best friend, um, but your best friend's new partner will. Mm -hmm. so, um, and so people feel some jealousy, yes. Um, they feel less jealousy when the best friend starts a new relationship than when the best friend has a new best friendship, even though that best friendship takes less time. Um, we do, though, is so even, so that's the, the sort of point one. Point two so, is that, oh, yeah. Go ahead, keep going, keep going, no. keep going. We, we also see some differences um, as a function of gender and relationship status too. Mm -hmm. So it might be personality and how much I, I sort of need you um, mm -hmm. dispositionally. Um, but it might also be, uh, I'm another single young woman and you are my person. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have my person mm -hmm. um, versus, oh yeah, you know, I'm married to go, go get it, have fun. I'll see you on Thursday. Right, <laughs> right. So I guess in that sense is that it sounds like there's, I guess, dimensions of jealousy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that's what it sounds like. Cause it's like, you know what? I don't want to lose you to another friend or qualitatively closer friend, let's say, or whatever, but I'm, I don't want to lose you to a romantic partner, but I kind of get it. And so it, it hurts less or it's less impactful or whatever. In both cases, there's still the fear of, I don't want to have a loss of the person. But it's um, it's different based on the 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 uh, social um, relationship, right? Where if it's a romantic partner or a friendship, is this about right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, think about fear, right? We don't have not fear and fear. We have different <laughs> layers of fear. Right, right. Um, jealousy, it's the same kind of thing. Um, and so from a, an evolutionary perspective, if this is an evolved mental program, um, 
it should be sensitive to certain inputs. So we might feel jealousy um, when our friend, our acquaintance makes a new friend and starts hanging out with them, but pretty little. Um, if it's a close friend, we're going to feel more jealousy. And if it's a best friend, we're going to feel even more jealousy because jealousy is calibrated to the value of the friendship that is threatened, right? Hmm. Um, but the the sort of oomph of friends is to become irreplaceable to them. Hmm. Um, and you want to be the person that's irreplaceable to them so that they really value you and give you all the benefits that you deserve, et cetera, et cetera. So if your friend makes a new relationship with somebody who can fulfill all the functions for them that you're fulfilling, then you should feel a lot of jealousy. So it's not about the time you spend together. Mm -hmm. It's not about whether or not you're having sex and it's a romantic relationship or not. Mm -hmm. It's, um, is this person going to replace me? So. I guess uh, this is probably, I think, just more on the clinical side and the more on individual psych of things. But I think that there is... Uh, even with all that said, still a potentially uh, unhealthy way of viewing that, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because obviously people are going to have different friends and people are going to have different friends that are very intimate and close and qualitatively uh, 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 useful and very edifying for the person. But that doesn't mean that someone's replaced. It's just a different type of relationship. It's a different person. Like, that's not going away. And even if they spend time and they're super close and they share things and maybe they don't with someone else, that doesn't mean that necessarily that, oh, well, this person's replaced or they've lost you. Obviously, yes, there is a bandwidth issue, but that doesn't mean that. And I think that and if there could be maybe some, you know, insecure attachment, there could be some uh, codependency, there could be some just kind of unhealthy dynamics there. I, I mean, what do you think about this? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think so. The system uh, of jealousy is probably designed to pay attention to um, how much of a replacement threat this new person is. Um, and it's possible that we can overestimate and that mm -hmm. maybe certain people with attachment issues are more likely to consistently overestimate. Mm -hmm. But I would guess that we're pretty good at picking up on these cues. So um, if we're best friends and, you know, you start a new job and you're spending 80 hours a week with this other person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably, you know, maybe time will make me a bit jealous. Sure. But I'm probably less likely to be jealous of you spending 80 hours with a new person than I am. If you start telling that person all your deepest secrets and going to them for help and doing all of the things that our friendship used to function to do for you. Mm -hmm. So um, we did an experiment where we made replacement threat really, really clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so we told people they read one of six vignettes and had to report their jealousy and reaction to it. Your best friend is um, uh, becoming potentially closer with this other person and they're spending all their time together or um, not that much time together, but they're becoming potentially closer. And then the replaced, so that was time threat. And then we varied what we called replacement threat. Um, so your best friend gets invited to this exclusive party. You really want to go. Their new friend really wants to go. Your best friend picks you and takes you. Or your best friend chooses them to go to this party. So they pick you over them or they pick them over you. Mm -hmm. And when you make it that clear and it's like an unmistakable sort of, are they, are they favoring me or are they favoring them? Jealousy tracks that. It doesn't check, track how much time you're spending with each other. If my best friend takes somebody else, I don't care whether they're spending all their time with that person or none of that time with that person. I feel jealous. Mm -hmm. If they pick me, I don't care if they're spending all their time with that person or none of the time with that person. I don't care. They pick mm -hmm. me. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a always, I guess, in, with jealousy of sorts. Is this where is the uh, 
you know, how full is that cup of sorts of loss? Do I have a lot of loss, a little loss, loss of the relationship, just loss of a certain event or a certain dynamic or whatever? Um, and I guess that is going to have <clears throat> uh, variance with indiv different individuals. Yeah, and sensitive to, I should say, to, to loss to a third party. So uh -huh. if you yes, ask yes. people, you know, um, you're losing your friend and your friend isn't playing basketball with you anymore, uh, they feel sad, but they don't feel jealous. Mm -hmm. If you say you're losing your friend and you're not playing basketball anymore, they're playing basketball with somebody else instead, you feel sad too, but then you feel jealous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I do want to come back to um, different aspects of, of uh, relationships here. Right? I, I do want to come back to the uh, cooperation and competition piece. But so before we kind of leave, I guess, friendship kind of directly, um, I want to ask about <clears throat> opposite sex friendships, right? So we've kind of talked about a little bit or mostly of sorts of, you know, kind of women being friends with each other and men being friends with each other. <sighs> I guess, uh, again, in terms of uh, averages here, obviously there's variance, but, you know, I've talked to people that say, you know, I don't think men and women can really be friends. There's always just going to be an underlying kind of maybe if you get really drunk one night or if you get really like in the right moment or if you, you know, if they're in a really vulnerable place or it just always potentially could happen, you know, where it dips in from friendship to maybe something else or other people have said mm, i don't know you cannot like men and women can't have deep close intimate relationships as friends because you know there's a certain point where you know just kind of physical stuff gets involved it's, it's bound to happen mm -hmm. um other people have said the opposite of course you know that person's you know how I would see a sibling. I could never imagine them physically. I could never, you know, whatever. Um, and everywhere in between. Um, I guess, what do you, what do you make of, of, because I do think friendships between opposite uh, sex can be complicated. It can be unique. I mean, all of it's complicated, right? You know, women with women, friendships that are complicated, men and men relationship, compl they're complicated in their own ways, but there are some unique, you know, kind of aspects of, uh, opposite sex uh, uh, friendships. So, w what do you think about the ideas of 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 this? So, yeah, I mean, when we're talking about like cisgendered, heterosexual, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, the um, which is like probably the the majority of these other sex friendships. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about them, of course, they exist, and of course, people are like, well, can they really exist? Because in some instances these friends are going to be backup mates or future prospective mates for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, they, they can also serve some functions that are uh, same sex friendships don't. So um, for example, uh, protection against other males, right? If, if for females are big, strong male football player friend can maybe deter other people from being a little handsy with us. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are some distinct functions and sex can be one of those functions. Mm -hmm. Um, then some people can mix sex into friendship. Usually, um, uh, in our data, we'll again, specify not romantic because mm -hmm. we don't want to get in, into and deal with that overlap, mm -hmm. but it seems like they happen. Um, it seems like in general, we want the same things and our same as in our other sex friends, kindness and trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, these friends can be backup mates or prospective mates, certainly. So given the greater possibilities there, it's no surprise that people are like, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, my kind of stance on this stuff is I think in all relationships, it's important to have healthy and appropriate boundaries that are um, in some occasions mutually agreed upon and other occasions it's not sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, someone's just got a different personality and some other person is like, you know what, like these are my boundaries and maybe that's not true for you, but that's what it is for me. So it's not always mutually exclusive, but I think sometimes it can be, I think that's true of any relationship, family, friends, coworkers, 
same sex, opposite sex, etc. And so I just think that, you know, if two people are friends and they're of the opposite uh, sex, right, in, in this cis hetero kind of dynamic, um, you know, I think that there's probably, uh, sometimes it's implicit, sometimes it needs to be explicit, just kind of some boundaries, some, you know, say like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in this, or, you know, I have somebody else, or this is what I want, or, you know, I think, you know, as adults, some people, that's pretty clear. And other people, it's less clear and that needs to be stated or reminded and sometimes hopefully not too many times. Um, but I just think in, as a general rule, even with same sex, you know, with females and females and males and males, that there should be, um, you know, healthy boundaries. That was kind of what I was mentioning before. Like, you don't want there to be like types of inappropriate attachments or codependency. And, and I think in opposite sex relationships, um, you know, if that's what's decided upon, right? Oh, okay. Like we just want this, whether they're single or committed or not or whatever. I think boundaries should always kind of exist in every kind of relationship. Sometimes that might be very, you know, liberal and small L, very broad. And sometimes it could be very narrow. So yeah. I just think it depends on the, I guess, the contours of each person's kind of interpersonal makeup. That makes sense. And you, you sort of figure out what your needs are and that's easier as you get older. Mm -hmm. um, also, I mean, these things can be uncomfortable to the extent that we have to do as potential friends, a lot of mentalizing. Yeah. So does that person think that I think that I want a relationship? Yeah. And if being, you know, in a committed relationship, can make it easier to make other sex friends because then you don't have to worry about, oh, they think that I want this. Mm -hmm. No, just, just hanging out. Mm -hmm. I, I should say too that um, uh, Hannah Bradshaw, um, uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's done some amazing work on girls, guys. Wait, guys, girls, sorry. <laughs> I always say that backwards mm -hmm. on guys, girls and how, um, the cue of being a woman hanging out with men and almost exclusively men um, can make other women dislike you and not trust you. Mm -hmm. But women who report being guys, girls say that they're that way because other women don't like them often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a, an interesting and potentially vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. We're yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm familiar with her. I think we follow each other online and stuff and she's great. And I think it's one of those things where on, on that concept that, um, you know, I think sometimes it can be in terms of, you know, the personality differences too, right? If sometimes from what I've heard, you know, clinically is some women will say, well, I grew up with all men in my house or I have a lot of brothers or, or sometimes it will be right. I, I don't really connect or get along with women as much as maybe other women do. And so I get along more or sometimes it could be an interest thing. Like I really like, you know, a particular sport or an activity. And so, um, so I think sometimes, I'm, I mean, I'm sure she would know more than obviously I would, but I, from what I've heard that there are different kind of components for that of why that's the case. Um, which is another dynamic. I mean, it's another kind of piece of it of sorts. Cause there will be, I think instances where, <clears throat> You know, like, uh, you know, let's say it's a sport event or something like that. And, you know, there's other guys there that might try to hit on the girl or something. And then you'll see kind of what you were saying. All the other friends that have been friends with her be like, hey, don't do that. She's not like that. You know, it's not like that. You know, this is just friends. She just hangs out with the guys or whatever. You kind of see some of the more, um, yeah. I don't want to say protective. That sounds kind of patriarchal, but like, you know, kind of coming to someone's defense. Yeah, um, yeah. That way. Stepping in. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it's um, a, oh, I was going to say what, what uh, we've kind of been touching on it. So I guess we can maybe put a, um, I guess we can put it in terms of a context where there's various con or environments, if you will, I guess let's do the workplace. I mean, that's, that might be an easy one to kind of to discuss of sorts. So what do we know about how women treat other women in the workforce? Um, I know that there's some people will say different things and they'll cite different pieces of data to, to prove whatever ideology they're, <laughs> they're trying to show or whatever, but as much as you know, or what you've looked at on this literature, what can we say about how women treat other women, um, 
in positions of authority and not more as this kind of equals uh, in terms of um, status or 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 um, of employee of being an employee somewhere. What um, what do we know about this? So uh, first, uh, in terms of ideology, I should say that yeah, I, I've come up against this as well, and often you'll have a lot of very well-meaning researchers um, uh, not like or, or dissuade from you from talking about findings that show that maybe women are doing an undesirable behavior like being mean to other women mm -hmm. um, because it might portray women who have been historically marginalized, especially in the workplace, uh, negatively. Um, the issue is if those are the data, then just denying that that is a reality isn't actually going to help anybody, including mm -hmm. the women who are on the you mm -hmm. know, receiving end. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm very much a the data say what the data say kind of person. Um, and I think that's that's also not just, you know, good science, but how in the heck are you going to act on reality if you want to pretend that reality is reality? Well, I think also, I mean, because you've said at different points in the conversation, not that you're seeing data as just the data in a vacuum like it also is within a context and an environment which is also super important but Absolutely. not at the expense of ignoring various data points you don't like for whatever agenda you have so it sounds like there has to be a more kind of holistic way of seeing this uh i mean i i certainly hope so and and so saying that i mean i think that women like men in the workplace um run the gamut there are some real assholes and there are some real wonderful mentors um, and women often deal with the full range. Uh, so we have a queen bee phenomenon that people talk about in this literature that sometimes one woman will succeed and get ahead, particularly in a male dominated area and not raise other women up. And in fact, maybe particularly keep other women down. Um, that's a possibility that seems to exist. Um, there also seem to be, and uh, we did this in, in my graduate program, groups of women that instead of bragging about, quote, quote, unquote, uh, all of the great publications they get, they'll ask their friends to brag for them. And that way, you know, you don't get the backlash for talking about how great you are. Somebody else is celebrating you and there are strategies to mitigate potential envy or whatnot. Um, they did that in the Obama White House. Uh, so, I mean, it runs the gamut, just like men. Um, mm. We just are very sensitive to it among women and it might look a little different when women do things like compete, for example. Is it, is it, are we just talking about, I mean, we're just talking about the differences, the spectrum of different, you know, pathology or personality or whatever, and that's no different than it is for men, or are there particular reasons why <clears throat> women may be um, holding other women down or back uh, and or boosting them up and, and trying to promote them? Is there, are there unique or distinct differences of why women may do this with other women as opposed to men or in different scenarios? I mean, I think some of the work would suggest that um, uh, because it seems as if women have to work so hard for maybe more fight as the fewer places at the top, um, that women have more of a zero sum psychology about other women's success. Um, and I've seen some work suggesting that, um, whereas uh, men seem to potentially, and again, I've, I've seen work suggesting this, and I, I'd have to go back and really dig into that to, to know better, but um, that men sort of have a, your win is my win, um, but also I'm going to viciously fight you for this promotion and then we'll have fears. Mm -hmm. um, so these things are all possibilities. I think. People like um, Alessandra Kassar, who's an economist at uh, UCSF, um, I think that's correct, <laughs> uh, but Alessandra Kassar is an amazing economist. She'll do field work that explores women's competition and um, uh, economic risk taking. And what we see is that under the right circumstances, women do all the things that men do. They take risks, they compete. 
Um, but the, uh, the sort of basal circumstances, so to speak, might have to be a little bit different. So hmm. women compete as much as men do. Uh, this is Corinne Apicella's work when women are competing against themselves. Um, in Kassara's work, women compete as much as men do when they're also allowed to cooperate. So hmm. I can compete, but I, I'm allowed to cooperate as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it might just be a function of context and we don't know it. Um, not that there probably isn't some sort of evolved alliance, coalitional psychology stuff going on, but we don't know it. Um, and that's certainly, there are not many evil-minded sort of IO people. Uh, Charlene Case is one of them. Um, Kayleen uh, McClanahan does some really cool work in that space. Well, I think that's definitely needed, but again, that's uh, swimming upstream, I think, nowadays. But I think... So I, I guess kind of on that, right, is <clears throat> I think it's true. I mean, again, in each, you know, this starts to kind of splinter, right? You know, different fields and disciplines are going to look at a little bit different. But one of the, I guess you could say now, mainstream narratives that we are told is that women have had it really hard in the workplace. They got to deal with a bunch of dudes that are not treating them well over-sexualizing them, being sexually inappropriate. We hear no, numerous cases about that. Um, that men have uh, held women back, that there's a patriarchal system within certain uh, uh, subsystems, including many places of work or in the workforce at large. Um, like this is stuff that's happened for a long time. And... You know, Jamie's telling me that it's just like, well, you know, men and women, they both compete. They both take risks. They both, you know, out for each I mean, how could you say that? I mean, there's so much evidence, right, that shows that, you know, men are out for women in the workforce and holding them down. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the party line, right, is there's a patriarchal society. That's how it holds us down. That still happens. How could we, how do we explain that? How do we say that that's not the case? Or maybe it's a little more nuanced. How do we understand that? I don't think those two things are in tension um, at all or in conflict. I think on one hand, uh, women have had to fight for a really long time for equal pay, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we're talking in the workforce, which and we're still not there. Um, and that's particularly women of color, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a conflict with that notion, that reality to say that women also run the gamut from nice bosses to assholes and women also have a psychology that's pretty similar to men's where women compete and they compete with one another and they compete with men and they cooperate with one another and they cooperate with men so uh that the there is a sort of largely similar psychology um although yes of course there are going to be some differences whether they're a function of sex gender culture etc um but there's a similar psychology uh on but for the most part even though there might be these nuances and differences i don't think that in any way disputes the idea that um yeah some men have been real assholes and probably more men on average than women but maybe that's because of power structures maybe because men have had the power and the freedom to do that uh, or maybe they're just really formidable or maybe x y and z so mm. you know, i i just don't see those things in, as in tension with one another yeah, I mean, I agree with you, obviously, right? I'm I'm doing my best steel band version of that argument. I think um, <laughs> um, I think I think I think both are true. Yeah. Um, I I would say that there's the way I would probably put it, it which makes some people upset, is I think that there's um, vestiges or ripples of mm -hmm. uh, a patriarchal society. I think in many fields and subfields, that's not the case anymore. Or, or it's not as a, uh, it's not as acted upon. So, you know, one example of this would be in medicine. There are more women now, there are more female doctors, and more that are graduating from medical schools than men. That wasn't the case 50 years ago. Um, there are many uh, environments where that's where that's not the case. There are environments where it still is, right? So I think that there's still maybe some, uh, and that could be for a variety of different reasons. But I think that. It can certainly be the case that there is a similar psychology for men and women in terms yeah. of there's some that can be really great and want to 
do some type of apprenticeship and mentorship and all that. But I think where this breaks down is like most things is these kind of broad sweeping absolutes, Mm -hmm. which is, well, if we just get women in positions of power, everything's going to be great. And it's, that's not the case. I think that there's that you could do that and you're still going to have some really terrible bosses that are women and you're going to have some really great ones that are women. And I think that that's the absolutes. And that's true of men as well. Right. And so I I think that it's one of those things where it's like, people will say, I've only had male bosses and they've all been great to me and I'm a woman. Right. They'll say that. And it's like, you know, that one or two times I had a female boss, it was terrible. Right. So, and that all that's just saying is the very easy thing of what you're saying is, is that humans are human and they're going to be like really terrible or they're going to be really awesome. And like, you know, it's not necessarily going to be more or less than, but I think where, where we get into trouble is where we make these absolutes of, you know, we just need to take all men out of positions of power and replace them with women. It's like, sure. Even if that was a viable option, it doesn't, because of our humanity, it doesn't mean that everyone's just going to be trying to prop up women and be awesome to them. There will be some that will do that, but there will be some that won't. And we see that happen now. We see where, you know, I mean, I've heard really terrible stories where it's like, I was so excited to work with this person and she was, you know, this and this and this. And then she treated me terribly. And it's like, and treating men better than me. And like, what? Like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be helping me out, right? We're like, you know, and and I, I've heard not just like one or two stories. I've heard a handful of stories personally about that, which is it creates like this weird fuzzy thing in a person's mind of like, well, uh, maybe I don't think those ways, or maybe there's more nuance to this. And so I think your, your, your initial answer is right. It's both things. They're, they're both things are play here. I mean, it, I just, whenever somebody says something like that, I mean, if they're not grandstanding, if they really sure. mean it. Sure, sure, sure. And I appreciate, you know, the, that it's well-meaning and where it's coming from. But it's also a little, a little sexist and infantilizing in itself. Like, mm-hmm. oh, so you think I'll just be like sweet, nurturing mom over here? Like, <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Friend. right right i want to win i'm ambitious i can be a real asshole too mm-hmm. and don't think that i can't be just because you know if, if i stop myself from saying it colloquially just because i have some ovaries over here <laughs> so uh i i mean yeah i mean i think these big sweeping sweeping statements are weird and and when people talk about so this goes back to some of our work on friendship and and mm-hmm. some stuff that um, I'm doing with again uh, my grad student Laurie and Mary, a grad student at UT and David Buss's lab, uh, Becca Hanel Peters and, and uh, Daniel Sneezer and Keila Williams, my best mm-hmm. friend. Um, we have been looking at what people want in friends, and this borrows so heavily from work by Aaron Lukashevsky and Jim Roney, which is basically like when you say you want somebody who's kind what you mean is that you want somebody who's kind to you and yeah okay sometimes you're actually going to want a friend who's a vicious mfer right yeah you just don't want them to be that way to you right and the the broader point that that daniel is is running with here is these evaluative concepts are indexed to the self so what it means when i say somebody has been nothing but a kind, supportive advisor to me, it means that they've, or nothing but kind and supportive. It means they've been nothing but kind and supportive to me. It doesn't negate the fact that they might be a bully to you. I'm just saying when they're kind, they're kind to me. And I think we intuitively understand that even if sometimes we quibble about it. I have to, uh, I'd have to, uh, I had to have to phone up Dan and see if he can get on the, on the call. But, uh, <laughs> I, um, I'm, I don't, I, I agree with that, but I, and maybe there's other stuff on this. So I don't want to speak out of ignorance, but I would say it's not just that though. I think most people, when they have what, when they, when, what they qualify as a really good friend is the one that's going to tell them, Hey, get your shit together. You're messing mm-hmm. up. Hey, listen, 
you know, no one else is going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. That's a good friend, right? I would, oh, yeah. that has to be part of the equation too. Cause we see that so many times like, ah, man, you're right. You know, or yes, you know what? I'm not going to hear that from anybody else. Or sometimes they will come to you because they're not going to get it. But the difference is there's enough trust and there's enough of a, a, a very established, you know, secure, safe relationship where you pretty much know the intentions of that friend that they're not going to try and be like, just doing it to be mean. They're doing it to be like, Hey, listen, Mm -hmm. I want to help you. So you don't like fall in the same ditch every time. Like that has to be part of the mix there too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I wouldn't, I mean, I would say if somebody is telling you like, uh, no, definitely don't wear that to give your top you a schmuck. Um, it's not vicious that that is, ultimately helping you yeah they're trying to help you <laughs> yeah. so yeah. the way that we we talk about this stuff at least in the friend preferences and again this is about friendship being like a series of three person problems rather than two person problems mm-hmm. um, all the work says you know we want friends who are nice and trustworthy and we don't want friends who are vicious and indifferent and that's canon and that makes sense sure but to us, I mean, that's the part. So if my friend kept my enemy secret, well, my friend would be really trustworthy. But say my enemy secret is about planning to poison me, that would be pretty shitty, right? <laughs> and if my friend were like a vicious, crazy person, um, but my friend's viciousness deterred somebody who wanted to do me harm from doing me harm, my friend's still vicious, but that's pretty good for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really do think that we, sometimes we just forget that concepts are indexed to the self. So I guess the, the other thing that I'm, there are many things I could, I could keep talking about, uh, with you. I, I, it's, it's so funny how, how fast time goes. And so I want to ask one thing, one, one other thing about, um, this competition and, and, uh, with, with cooperation, is this idea of so again right like i'm aware of uh you know pretty negative stereotypes so i want to be mindful of that so i do want to ask about physical attractiveness and what Mm -hmm. that looks like between women and how they do or don't view that do they view that as a type of competition and do men do that are men trying to be like hey this guy's more like you know, has bigger muscles or he has a better jawline or he's got great hair or whatever. Like, is it this, again, the kind of gendered thing of like, well, are women just doing this or men doing this? And if so, what does that look like? Um, so yeah, just that. And then I have a follow up. Yeah, so, I mean, you could think of a bunch of different ways that you can compete for partners. And I think in this space, people are particularly talking about a uh, heterosexual mating competition. Um, although, you know, being an attractive person and Adar Eisenbrook and Jim Roney have some cool stuff on this. It's not just that looks mean, you know, fertility or whatever, but Mm -hmm. you could be, it it could signal all sorts of benefits that you can generate for other people. Um, but okay. So yeah, attractiveness really matters a lot for women. Um, it doesn't not matter for men, Mm -hmm. um, self beautification can be something that women do to make themselves feel good. It could also be something that women do and maybe it even feels good because it increases uh, their desirability as a partner, whether a mate or a friend. Um, And that's true for men as well. What we do see is that um, so really strong men are more likely to have been in a lot of altercations Um, probably because it's effective for them that they win. And they're often the ones who start those altercations. Hmm. Um, What we seem to see among women, and I think it's, it's a little messier than, than I'm going to talk about. um, Women who are more attractive are often disproportionately targeted Hmm. for women's aggression. So Um, they might not always start it. Yeah. So, so just kind of with that, would that mean that there is this idea of like an attractiveness privilege that some people say, like there's different types of privileges, but like some people you can't help what you're, I mean, some people try to augment it, but 
you know, what people, you know, are, have been shown, I guess, objectively that this person is physically attractive and more so than maybe other people. Is that a kind of privilege that they have to kind of wear? Like, um, gosh, I just, I don't know. I think of, I can't think of an actress, an actress that everyone thinks is like, uh, Elizabeth Taylor. I'll just choose somebody from, from another time. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor. Everyone was like, yes, she's gorgeous. She's super attractive physically, blah, 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 blah. And more so than other people, her peers or other folks, that's a type of, privilege or no is this is that going too yeah. far i mean of, of course i think so if we're talking about uh like diversity equity inclusion -y stuff mm -hmm. attractiveness is probably one of the biggest features that doesn't get talked about in this space mm -hmm. um, my graduate stereotyping and prejudice class um, we were talking about just this Mm. Right. So we're aware of gender. We're aware of race. We're aware of sexuality stuff, uh, mm. first generation status and so on. Um, but we don't talk about attractiveness. And yet, for example, thinner women can make twenty thousand dollars more a year. Wow. These are huge wow. effect sizes of being good looking and all of the stuff that it gets you males as well. Yeah. yeah. But perhaps particularly for females when it comes to um, educational opportunities, their parents supporting them, the money that they get paid at work. Uh, so absolutely a thousand percent, it is a privilege. And in fact, some of our very recent work suggests that at least in people's minds, um, whereas uh, like male physical strength is a cue to that man's high status, female's physical beauty is a cue to that female's high status. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, what do we, obviously people are going to know this, they're going to see this and then, you know, <laughs> how this maps on for men, right. In, in the world, right. There's, that's a, an element where obviously there's some pretty terrible men that will use, try to have certain gains like, Oh, this person's attractive. Let me see how far I can push the envelope on, you know, on certain behaviors, which is obviously horrible to do. And then there are um, other, it seems like other women that are, you know, have certain negative feelings about their fellow woman that's attractive. So kind of going to this point of for men and for women in terms of people that are interacting with the person that is physically attractive, kind of to your initial point, they're the ones targeted, right, on, from both ends of it from other women for various reasons, whether it's, uh, you know, kind of the old, like, you know, kind of, uh, pair bonding, right. Is this person going to find a mate and I won't find a mate because they have better, you know, things going for them or, and then obviously the issues with men. So is it, is it just always that it's kind of like they're targeted or what are some other complexities here? Well, so, I mean, uh, with Tracy Vianco, um, I have this chapter that she is the lead on and this is her idea and it's super cool um for females and i say females because girls and women it's just easier um sure, sure. Uh, it seems like at least in youth beauty is something that it gains people's attention mm -hmm. and you can turn attention i mean especially this these days in the respect to social media but you can essentially translate attention into all of these other goodies like popularity and social mm. influence that wins you a lot of points including potentially fitness points mm. so if you're a, a girl who is beautiful you can turn that attention into popularity you can then consolidate that popularity by being um, particularly indirectly aggressive and not letting other people ascend to your heights mm. Um, and if that's the case and you engage in sort of, um, you know, a little bit of bullying or uh, mm -hmm. aggression, effective aggression against other girls, you might win the dating game. Mm -hmm. You know, people do not often want to go up against the queen bee mm -hmm. um, in these uh, sort of high school scenarios. So, uh, I mean, you can translate things like beauty early on into all sorts of goodies. Um, and I, I don't think we talk about it. And 
perhaps again, like maybe it's well intentioned, like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, we want women to be able to have male typical status. And when we talk about status, we talk about male typical aspects of it, like political power. Um, and maybe those things shouldn't be male typical, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally get that, honor that. But at the same time, if beauty is functioning for women like status to help them get priority access to contested resources, I don't think we should poo poo that as a form of status just because women have it or it's like the comes in pink version. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree with your, your, with what you're saying in terms of, you know, it, it is a thing and it is something that isn't talked about. And it is something that I think is, I think it's like any of these things, right? I, I think it's difficult to talk about because it, 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 it's, it makes people uncomfortable or, you know, kind of acknowledging it. But I think if we're able to do that and if we're able to look at you know, continue to study many of these things and, and we're able to say, what can we know about this? And then what can we do about it? Which I guess leads me to my last question, which is there are, we've talked about it at different points in the conversation, but there are many ways in which women really help other women oh, right? hell yeah. um, that are super cooperative. They're super, um, involved in making a type of a kind of, I don't know, say of alliance, but this kind of way of kind of banding together, maybe differently than how men do it. Um, and I'm not saying men is the standard or they do it, you know, better or whatever. I'm just saying like they're, it's, it's just different. Um, so maybe just tell us again, uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but just a, even, I guess, more specifically on many of the positive features, um, because there certainly are, like, I think it can be extremely powerful if, a woman has uh, a mentor or, or, you know, in the workforce or, or in academia, some type of kind of apprenticeship, things like that, where it is a woman, you know, helping another woman. And when that happens, it can be super, super powerful. It can be super, super important. Um, and so maybe just talk, I guess, some of the, the, the positive aspects of how women cooperate with other women and, and how that can be really, really helpful for social groups and for individuals. Yeah, I mean, I I would be remiss if I didn't say that I have enjoyed some really incredible mentorship from women. So my formal mentors have been men, but um, people like uh, Deb Lieberman, Marty Hazelton, Sarah Hill, uh, Athena Kippis, Christina Taranti, um, and then here at my university, Jennifer Bird Craven. I mean, if I had not had people like those to watch my back, give me advice, write me letters, I would not be where I am today. And I also don't have to reinvent the wheel because they have been there before. Um, They know which battles are worth fighting. Mm -hmm. Jen can tell me, like, just don't even talk about this in a faculty meeting. Just shut your mouth and grimace, but just don't just, you know, be safe. And that's so important to be able to have that. But I I also should say just on a a larger research level, um, it's not like women and men uh, have different amounts of how much they love their friends or friendship or value friendship. Um, But you could think about it as women place more of their eggs in a best friend basket. Mm -hmm. And so having that person Mm. can be really calming. Yeah. Um, when facing uh, challenges, for example, having your friend with you uh, on a physiological level can be better for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll do better work when you feel like you're supported. And some of the data suggests that, um, again, uh, partially maybe mediated by how important best friendship is for women, having friends is a boon for health. Um, and maybe the best example of this is from some of Joan Silk's data and baboons. Um, for females, a few female friends increases the longevity of their offspring. Mm. Like, that's fitness. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's something that is, again, we, we have to talk more about many of the positive aspects of, of right, obviously, female companionship and cooperation with each other. And then also, you know, where does that 
where does that sit in in society and how that can be a really um i think um positive or adaptive thing in many different contexts and so i think the, the research that you and many other people have done is, is super important uh well <laughs> jamie there's so many things uh, we didn't talk about uh, that I'm sure we can get to at some point later. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the time the time goes by so quick. Um, and uh, I could literally talk to you for hours. It's uh, so much fun talking to you about all this stuff. And, and so um, where can people um, find your research and find you and where are all the, the, the most relevant places? Oh, uh, so come find us on the Ocean website, uh, Ocean at Oklahoma State, uh, cremslab.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, despite my best efforts to be a sane person. Um, yeah, so find us there. Uh, look at what people in Ocean are doing. I think, um, you know, our, our grad students are some of the people that really will lead the future of this work that that are honoring the fact that women need each other and help each other and that it's not uh counter to that to say that women can also really hurt each other it's mm -hmm. the reality of the situation and so i think they're they're gonna do really cool work yeah uh, that's that's great well i can't say enough thanks uh it's really really uh, been so much fun and uh i uh, really really am grateful I am so thankful to be here. This is amazing. This is a lot of fun. So anytime you uh, unfortunately want all of Ocean back, like we're, we're going to descend on you and email you. <laughs> That's totally fine. My experience with people that are, are there are super uh, fantastic and do great work. So uh, you guys are doing good stuff over there. So uh, it was great, great talking to you. And I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty. 